Okay. I grew up in Glasgow, that's in Scotland, and at lunchtime I used to go out and get a fritter roll for lunch. Now a fritter is like a big potato, and you deep fry it in batter, and then eat it in a white buttered roll. Maybe a dumb way to die. <laughs> now, that type of eating was normal for me. Now, then I went to uni, and I ended up inheriting an allotment. And I didn't really know what to do with it at the beginning, but over time I realised that I'd been missing something. I'd been missing the connection with the land, with the soil, with the seasons, and maybe even to Scotland. And then through my work as a landscape architect, I learned about this concept called biophilia, which is the theory that we as humans really need contact with nature. You know, it makes us feel great, makes us feel happy. It makes us more productive and makes us less stressed. But the allotment also reduced my shopping bills. I met loads of really great people that I would never normally come into contact with. I learned how not to build a shed from pallets. The shed actually fell down and squashed all of my neighbor's vegetables. <laughs> and then, as a landscape architect, I began thinking about public space and how we use land. Then I started strategic planning and realized that we were missing a vital ingredient in plans, and that was food. So Melbourne used to be ringed by orchards and dotted with backyard veggie patches. But over time, we've sprawled over the orchards. We've built over our backyards, and we've become disconnected with our food system. Our food's delivered in trucks. We've completely lost connection with it. Now, we're all getting fatter. <laughs> When I used to watch Home and Away and Neighbours, I expected everyone in Australia to be really thin and bronzed and gorgeous. But actually, <laughs> Australians are getting fatter too. It's not just the Scots. 63% of Australians are now overweight or obese or nutritionally overachieving. <laughs> Since 1995, we've all got about four, kilogram, four, four kilograms heavier, and that trend is set to continue. Over the next 10 years, we're just going to keep on getting fatter. So what can I, our city do for us? Now, Melbourne's expanding. Urban growth is a big topic in planning. The urban growth boundary keeps getting bigger. We're becoming more and more disconnected from our food chain. The productive land close to the edges of our city is getting built upon. As we expand further and further out, this situation contributes to the pandemic of obesity and the loss of connection with our food system. And now we just can't afford to continue like this. We can't afford to do business as usual when it comes to the design of our cities. We really need to think more productively about what we, how we use land and how we use spaces. The dream is to bring food production, food growing and sharing into the streets, into the city, into our consciousness and into our normality. Is it possible to change our culture by changing our landscape? So city building is a really complicated process. The city is a giant pulsating beast. Sometimes the wheels move really, really slowly. It's quite hard to refocus our attention on how the city should develop. When we get good at something, we tend to do it over and over again. We've seen loads of different movements in urban design and planning. So Ebenezer Howard's garden cities, Corbusier's modernism, new urbanism. There's loads of different things, but ultimately, city planning and urban design sometimes takes a long time to change. But what we're realizing now is that the city has, because, has this new purpose. We're realizing that actually living in the city is really effective. It's really sustainable. But we just need to work out how we can get that connection with nature in that urban city context. And also, we're seeing people flocking into the city. For the first time in history, there's more people living in an urban context than in a rural context. And by 2030, 60% of the global population will be living in cities. So what about this question of underutilized land and how we use it? And is there really any underutilized land in Melbourne? As it turns out, there's loads. There's lots of public land hidden behind chain link fences. There's lots of Vic track land just waiting for something to happen. And development sites that often lay empty, underutilized and sad, sometimes for years. We've got rooftops, 
road reservations, the leftover edges. Now we're not talking about parks and gardens and play spaces and areas of habitat. What we're talking about is the leftover lots that harbour this idle energy. And we want to find some way of unlocking this land to allow the communities to become involved in their local spaces. So the question is, how can we unlock this land for the community? What can we do with these development sites to try and connect people back into the food system and make it normal, easy and fun to grow fresh and healthy food? We've been thinking about this a lot over the past couple of weeks, having lots of conversations with developers, with the government, with the council, with the community, trying to come up with a solution that would maybe unlock land on a temporary basis, on a long-term basis, and allow us to use this land productively. Now, what I'd love to see is a long-term vision of behaviour change in the planning system. We want to engender a change that can ultimately change the Victorian planning system and embed urban food growing as a legitimate land use and ultimately change the way that developers build. So, make me real, this is the fun bit. Now, We've seen a lot of great stuff that's happening in New York at the strategic level, uh, a transport planning level, which I find absolutely amazing. <laughs> they're looking at the way that public space can be used more productively. But they're also doing stuff at the grassroots level. Now, the wonderful Peter Huff told me about this project, 596 acres in New York. The project maps underutilized land in the city. But it doesn't just do that, it also allows people to meet each other, to gather together and to organise. It was started by lawyers, so they understand how difficult it actually is to access this land, and came up with solutions to help the community get through those barriers. Now, we began to think about what this might look like in Melbourne. You know, we're in the best city in the world, it's great to live here. How can it be any better? We're not Detroit. We're not New York, we're not Brooklyn. What might it look like? Uh, as we've discovered, there is a lot of underutilised land. There's lots of new arrivals to our city who don't have land, but have skills to grow. So, again, we began thinking and talking to as many people as we could get our hands on. We had conversations with developers, with planners, with landscape architects, with mappers, with data analysts. We began to understand the power of data and the open source movement. We began to understand how important it is to share all of this information. So we want to create a website similar to 596 acres that will help to unlock this land for communities. We understood from talking to lots of people, we really needed to understand what people wanted. I know what I wanted. I miss my allotment. <laughs> I missed hanging out with all the old guys. You know, all of my friends in Melbourne are my own age. We found out that users also wanted access to land, access to resources and access to other people. We found that service providers, so the people like the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, wanted, they wanted to try and connect people back into the social situation. They wanted to try and reduce any pressure on their services. They wanted to build skills and build social equity. And landowners wanted a managed risk. They wanted to manage their asset, and they wanted a positive public promotion. So when we think about managing risk, this project, this 3,000 acres project, needs to, <clears throat> needs to create a toolkit to be able to manage that risk. We need to work with lawyers and activists and landscape architects and planners. Now, we want to transition development sites and build learning gardens, so sites aren't just left for years and years, lying underutilised and unloved. We want to build these learning gardens and teach skills. Teach skills on how to build raised beds, how to plant, how to preserve. You know when you get loads of zucchinis after a year, what do you do with them? Hopefully we'll be able to teach these skills in an urban context. But ultimately, we're looking towards a reshaping of the planning system and getting everybody onto the same page. So we have to ask ourselves, is there really an appetite for this in Melbourne? Is this something people are looking for? Over the past six weeks, it seems that it really is. We've managed to sign up a number of partners. 
We've got the Royal Botanic Gardens on board. We've got two inner city councils. We're looking outside. We want some metropolitan councils as well. We've even got developers. We have our first development site from Neo Metro. Apologies in advance. That's Neo Metro, not Neil Mitchell. <laughs> So the site's in Fitzroy. This car park would have lain underutilised and unloved for a year, maybe two. But our project, 3,000 Acres, will unlock this land and build a fresh food hub in Fitzroy. We'll teach skills, we'll join up with a local social enterprise and teach cooking skills and share information with them. The future is bright, the future is productive. I'd love it if you could help us create a fresh food city. 